I've been in this room for eight years now, Clarice. And I know they will never ever let me out while I'm alive. What I want is a view. I want a window where I can see a tree or even water. I want to be in a federal institution far away from Dr. Chilton. What did you mean by fledgling killer? Are you saying that he's killed again? I'm offering you a psychological profile in Buffalo Bill based on the case evidence. I'll help you catch him, Clary. Welcome to the 40th episode of The Fear of God, 4-0. Uh, we are almost at a whole year spending time with you guys uh, and gals talking about this unique, sometimes lonely, sometimes highly populated intersection between the horror genre and the Christian faith. I am your co-host. Nathan Ralphs, typically with me, is just old friend Reed Lackey. Um, he was here a second ago. He said something about some Chianti and some fava beans, some sort of snack or whatever he wants to have. You know, I, I occasionally have a beverage of choice. And, but yeah, he was saying something about some Chianti, which, you know, I like some wine. Fava, I don't know about fava beans, but uh, Reed, there you are, man. Hello, Nathan. Whoa! Whoa, Reed! What's the matter? What's off over there? Oh my! <laughs> there it is. That's what I was waiting for. That's what I was waiting for. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Yeah. I'm so glad that you went with Lecter for that introduction because if you were going to tell me that I heard he had to try out a new outfit and was going to dance in front, I was going to interrupt you. I was going to stop you dead in your tracks. I thought no, about it. Not allowed. I, I, I thought about it, and, and truthfully, I would have rather gone that route. I just couldn't, in the moment, uh-uh. wrestle down where. If you had, if you had gone there, if I had even the glimmer of an idea that you were going to go there, I was going to shatter the facade like a pane of glass. I was going to burst through like, no, not allowed. So, so here we are. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm doing very well. I'm excited to be talking about this movie. I, uh, this is again one of my one of my very very favorite films of all time, and uh, it, it is. We haven't sad. Even said what it is. You're like alluding to a thing. I, I was. Yeah. I was talking about. I was talking about Stuart Little. What are you talking about? Wow, you with all the with all the play Stuart Little gets on our podcast, you need to watch that movie. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, but uh, but uh, and it is a little sad. It's a bit bittersweet. Um, we are talking this week for our iconic 40th episode. Uh, we're covering the uh, film from 1991, the Academy Award winning "The Silence of the Lambs." But multiple Academy Awards, right? Oh, in fact, I was going to say this them. for yeah, I was going to say this for trivial bits, but. We should mention it here. It is one of only three films in cinema history to win the big five Academy Awards. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Screenplay. I can name one of the other ones. I What's the rem- other one? I always try to remember this little anecdote. Um, I know one of them is Cuckoo's Nest. That's correct. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is the second one. Oh, tell me. What is it? First one is It Happened One Night, an early Frank oh, Capra yeah, film. Would- I would not yeah. have gotten to that. Yeah. So, uh, starring. So, uh, we'll just say it was. We'll just say it was Batman Superman. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, oddly, is Batman versus Superman, which was which was uniquely Strangely recognized enough. by the Academy. <laughs> uh, so, so okay. So, part of the reason we're talking about this film, we hadn't planned on covering this at this point in time, but unfortunately, uh, the prolific and much applauded director Jonathan Demme. 
director of Silence of the Lambs, has passed away. And so we are covering this iconic, brilliant, amazing film in tribute to him and his legacy. Although, I am saddened to say that when I was looking over his filmography, I've only seen four or five of his films. He's a pretty prolific filmmaker, but I've only seen four or you five of his films. You call yourself a fan. Uh, I know. I don't understand. Put I the haven't... microphone down. <laughs> so much of his <laughs> 70s work is is a blind spot to me, but, but I'm going to have to to go back and check out some of these things. Some of the some of the early 70s crime thrillers sound really, really interesting. The only other prominent film that I've seen, I've seen Silence of the Lambs multiple times, but uh, the only other prominent film that I'm familiar with is Philadelphia. Have you ever seen Philadelphia? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Philadelphia is a very affecting film, and um, it really has some profound emotional resonance. I have a strong memory of it, even though I've only seen it twice, um, and not in many, many years. Um, but that's a pretty affecting film, but... Silence of the Lambs. I mean, I've I've seen this film probably more than a dozen times. This is uh, this is a recurring theme. But before we get too heavily into Silence of the Lambs, what you what you watching? What you reading, Nathan? Yeah. Yes. What you watching? What you re- what, what you watching? What you reading? What you watching? What you reading? to come on there. What you watching? <laughs> um, yeah. So what you watching? What you reading? It's an important new segment of our show. Uh, I had seen the first season. But it takes forever for it to hit Hulu, so I, I just have to abide um, until it does. But I just s- jumped into season two of Fargo. Have you watched any of that show? Oh, I've seen all of season one and all of there... season two, and I love it. Oh, really? I love okay. it. Yeah. yeah, I haven't started I am, uh... season three yet because I'm watching some. Well, you know stuff. Our, our 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 love of leftovers, Carrie Coon Carrie Coon, is in she that. stars in yeah. it. I know, and Mary Elizabeth Winstead is in it. Really? Yeah. Okay. And Ewan McGregor, like it's a great cast. I didn't know that. Um, what is nice is. I can watch season two on Hulu and season three is currently in the Fargo app. So I'm hope I mean, in the FX app. So I'm hoping to be able to finish season two in a timely fashion. I mean, season two is great. Yeah. I've heard nothing but praise. It's, nothing it's wonderful. But praise. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, when episode two has Landry Clark from the Dylan Panthers turning a Culkin brother into hamburger. I mean, like, Oh my gosh. Gracious. Yeah. I think you mean, Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, man. I <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, I'm watching Fargo. What you watching? What you reading, Reed? So, speaking of just outstanding, amazing television, Nathan. Yeah. Brother, I love you, man, but you've got to, got to, got to get back on the Better Call Saul horse. You've got to, got to, yeah. got to. I got my wife into it. So, my, my beloved wife, she texted me the other day. And she had she had two things to tell me. One was uh, something just uh, sort of, you know, informative marriage doing life thing. And then the second thing that she sent me is she said, by the way, I'm really into Better Call Saul, which she knew would just delight me because so many sure. times I like drag her along with these shows that I'm really affectionate for. But she only sort of tolerates. But, dude, it keeps getting stronger and more profound. And it's it's effortless. How Vince Gilligan just manages to just spit out. He burps great cinema. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And I called it cinema. It's television, but it feels like cinema. It's so, sure. it's so rich. Now, and its how would you, so, okay, okay, oh. okay. You're, you're, you know, I'm, I'm going to get there. So it's three has started, right? They're in three. They're halfway through three. Yeah. Okay. How do you compare three to two? I've not watched two. I heard Okay. So mixed. season one is a solid 10 for me. Season one is amazing. Season two hits like an eight and a half, nine. Season two has some really killer moments, but overall, it packs less of a punch than season one does. There is an episode in season three that is easily my favorite episode of the whole show. Favorite episode of the whole show. And I think, so only being halfway through, I don't know. The seasons have a habit of not revealing their biggest plot points until the last like three episodes. So... The fact that episode five of season three is one of my favorite episodes of the entire run of the show. I have no idea what they've got up their sleeve, but so far season three is packing every bit the punch that season one did, if not a stronger one. It is. And I will say that for the first time, uh, I heard this on a sort of an interview show with Vince Gilligan, but I will say for the first time, I feel like I have just watched the 63rd episode of Breaking Bad. Like tonally, it was already kind of in the same ballpark. But there's an episode in season three that I was like, this this is Breaking Bad. Like, th- this is absolutely wow. that that same level. And uh, and it's wonderful. I, I, I love it so much. Well, I mean, hear yeah. me. Like, I, I don't... I, I did watch season one. For me personally, it wasn't a 10. 
Um, I have nothing but love for the creative team, for the, the performers. Um, it was, it was slower than I was ready for. You know, I think in, in due time, I will get to it with your continued, uh, lighting a fire. You know, I, I may get there faster than I would have anticipated, but, but yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I know that's a, I know that's a, a deep love of yours in the TV world. Um, oh, one other thing I did start in the Whatcha Weedin', Whatcha Weedin', Whatcha, whatcha Weedin', weedin Whatcha Watchin', Whatcha Watchin', Whatcha Weedin', um, <laughs> category was, was, uh, we are two episodes into the monstrously oppressive Handmaid's Tale. Have you watched any of this? No. Um, you read the book though, right? I have many years ago. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, yeah, talk about a heavy and, Unfortunately, very timely uh, subject matter. Oh but, my um, gosh! Yeah, it's yeah, it's. I can only imagine would, what that show it would, would be. A brand of horror. I mean, like, mm. I don't know where. I don't. I have no idea where the story goes. So I'm only two episodes mm. in, but I was describe. You know, the le- the leftovers is its own brand of heavy. Yeah, The Handmaid's Tale might be just in these two episodes some of the heaviest yeah. TV I've ever consumed. Like, there's a scene or two in in one of the episodes where I was like, I was just kind of emotionally on the edge anxiety wise the whole time. Like, yeah, because I don't know, there's something about, and actually it's interesting where I go with some of the themes of this particular movie we're talking about, but I mean, I've got three daughters. I've got a wife. I, I've got a younger sister. Of course I have a mother and I live in Trump's America. And some of the stuff is prophetically on mm. point in a not in a way you don't want it to be. Right. Um, right. Anyway. Yeah. It's, it's powerful. Yeah, I, I, I've been meaning to. It's a show that I know I'll eventually get to. And, um, sure. you know, I don't know if I'll see that while it's still running or if I'll catch it uh, sometime after it concludes the season. But, yeah, it's I'm sure it's very effective. In answer to your response of like horror, I think we have some we've, we've established some leeway in terms of, uh, you know, kind of what we consider horror and not. It just depends on how how dark uh, the, the, right, the broad right, right. the broad application of the word dark, you know, because like we covered the sure. gift, even covering 10 Cloverfield Lane, like those are considered more thrillers than they are horror. But yeah, they, they there's definitely some leeway to be had, I'll call it um, in sure. in some consideration there. But no question whatsoever about the horror of of tonight's film. Uh, or today's film, whenever you're listening to this episode. Well, um, don't forget, don't forget before we leave. Um, I mean, now that we're leaving, what you watching? What you reading? Are you gonna do that every time? I just want to know. Uh, I might. I might. <laughs> um, don't forget, Reed. You gotta. You gotta talk about. Uh, we're getting the people oh, yes. involved. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness! I mean, Thank you for got, reminding me. Got, yeah. You know, homework. Yes. So, so we are very soon going to be having, uh, well, I say very soon in the fall, we're going to be having a very special series called hashtag I love the nineties call out to, uh, early VH one days. And we need some participation from you because as part of that series, we are going to be unveiling the listener voted listener selected 25 favorite films of the 1990s. So what we need horror films. Yeah. Sorry. Specifically. Favorite horror films of the 1990s. So what we need from you is we need to have some nominations for what you think belongs on the list. So as briefly as I can, I'll just say you need to email us at fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word, fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. Email us with the subject heading hashtag I love the 90s. And in the body of your email, along with any other comments you may want to give to us, please give us up to 10 films that you think belong on a list of favorite horror films of the 90s. I'll, I'll say the same three stipulations. They do not have to be ranked. You can just list them because this is just the nominations. So they do not have to be ranked. They do not have to be 10. If you can only think of two that you think belong on the list, email us anyway. These are just nominations at this point. So bring in two of them, five of them, all 10. Uh, just limit yourself to 10, if you would, please. And then, uh, yeah, we'll be submitting for you at a later date the opportunity to rank those films that get nominated. But uh, the only other thing, as I would say, is, of course, being the 90s, it has to have been made sometime between 1990 and 1999. So, uh, yeah. and oh, And the final distinction we'll make is there's always a big debate about do you pick the best? Do you pick your favorites? We're killing that distinction. We want your favorites, your personal favorites. You may think the movie objectively is garbage, but you love it and you love watching it. Put it on the list. We want to see what you guys think. Uh, your nominations for the favorite horror films of the 1990s. I'm getting so excited for that series. Thanks for reminding me. Yes. Fear of God podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, that's going to be fun. So now, now read. Now we can 
Hello, we can, Nathan. You know, yeah, we can get our Chianti. <laughs> We and our fava, our fava beans. beans. I've never actually eaten fava beans. I don't know if they're. I don't, I don't know. know if they would I don't be know good. That I, w- I don't know that I'd want to. Yeah, I don't know if I can now. Um, so tell me some bits, Reed. So, so a couple things going back to that element of the Oscars that we were talking about earlier. It's interesting to me that Anthony Hopkins wins Best Actor for this for less than twenty five minutes of screen time in a two hour movie, which I think is staggering. <laughs> I mean, admittedly, no other single actor is on screen more frequently than he is but it's just fascinating to me that that he wins for less than 25 minutes of screen time but is considered best actor instead of best supporting actor although his presence looms heavy sure. over the film anyway yeah. so it's it's understandable um it's also specific to our show and the framework of our show um it's also the only horror film to ever win best picture to ever win an academy award for best picture and it's one of only five to ever be nominated so academy name is em. name them oh so okay so the five horror films that have ever been nominated are the Sixth Sense, huh. Jaws, The Exorcist. Ooh, we should cover Jaws. Oh yeah, I, we should we should definitely do Jaws, The Exorcist, and Black Swan. Really? Those are the only. Yeah, those are the only. And and of course, Silence of the Lambs. Which one? Those are the only five horror films to ever be nominated for Best Picture, and Silence of the Lambs is the only one to have won. So uh, that, you know, the Academy is not known for recognizing or acknowledging horror films, um, but I think it's telling that not only did it win Best Picture, but it also won the other four of those big five, as we mentioned earlier. The last two things I want to mention in terms of trivial bits, something that you'll appreciate, I'm sure. Uh, I think I shared this with you off, off pod, as it were, but Clarice Starling is a direct inspiration for one Dana Scully. Of the X Files. Delete that off your list, Nathan. Oh! I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. I did delete it off my list, like just right now, but I don't care. <laughs> uh, but yes, I knew you would. I knew you would appreciate that. That, uh, that yeah, that Clarice Starling is sort of the Dana Scully prototype, and I can see it. Like it's even in the look and the 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 costume design and everything. Like I, I I can see it. The last thing that I want to mention may seem sort of an odd insertion, but I wanted to um I wanted to mention this. So the the character of Buffalo Bill, obviously a very disturbing, haunting kind of character. Uh, we'll talk about him more when we get into you know sort of the more specifics of the film. But I found it interesting that the actor Ted Levine, who plays Buffalo Bill, and the actress Brooke Smith, who plays his victim Catherine. They were very good friends on set. Like, they were very close on set, very comfortable with each other, to the degree that the rest of the cast were joking about Stockholm Syndrome. The reason I, I, the reason I thought that was interesting to note is because the character of Buffalo Bill is so deeply disturbing to me, so deeply, deeply disturbing as a character, and Ted Levine imbues him with such a creepiness and such a sleaziness that it... it heartens me to know that like on set that that Ted Levine seems to be like a really good guy and seems to be like a genuinely, you know, well-rounded, sure. kind, generous, good-hearted person. Um, well, I mean, it be- is Ray Reed. I mean, it's, it's acting. Is it? Know? Is it, though? Like, is it? It's, how do I know the words? <laughs> on <a> script. <laughs> and... Action wizard! <laughs> that was a, you like that was that? a great extra. Style. Oh my gosh, um, that scene! So, um, but yeah, so that's that's uh, that's the end of my trivial bits. Um, bleeding into likes, dislikes. I know I get criticized a lot by you, my good friend for lists? Nathan. For what? Um, no, for for how young I was when I saw these films. So I have a vivid memory of the first oh, time no. I saw The Silence of the Lambs. My father was a pastor. He was also an evangelist. And frequently, we would travel uh, where my family would do family ministry. My mother would often speak or sing. My father would often preach. Our our whole family would get involved to some capacity. But um, I have a vivid memory because sometimes when we would travel and we would travel great distances, we would stay in hotels. And hotels were great because they had HBO. And my parents... Uh, would frequently go to sleep rather early. I'm a night owl, so I would stay up and I would watch HBO when I couldn't, you know, sorry, mom, sorry, dad, but I would. Uh, They were sleeping in the next bed and I would stay up and watch HBO, which we didn't have at home because it was awful. Right, Um, because it was sinful. But uh, but I watched, and one night I was like, oh, what's this movie? The Silence of the Lambs. You're like, Jesus is the lamb who was slain. I bet this is a Christian movie. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) 
Nathan, I was 13 years old. Well, that's not too bad. I was 13 years old. I know that's not as bad as like, you know, eight, but I was right. 13 years old. Have a vivid memory of sitting there like, huh, what's this like watching Silence of the Lambs? In a hotel wow. room while my mom and dad are sleeping. And, I'm, and I've got the volume turned like way down and I've got like the closed captioning on like, oh my goodness, what am I, I what just, am I supposed to I do? I just have this image oh. of little Reed crying in front of the screen in the middle of the night, but he can't wake his parents up because then you have to confess that you're watching HBO. And Oh man. man. Well, I gotta, t- I gotta tell you, man, Hannibal Lecter's escape, like that, that's indelible. Like I can still, I'm sitting here having this conversation with you. I can visually remember sitting on that hotel bed, seeing... Hannibal Lecter's escape sequence for the first time. I mean, it was wow. it, it was deeply affecting for me, and st- and still is. But yes. So, I, when did you see the film for the first time? Um, not in that scenario. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as a mature adult who could handle, <laughs> I, I, I should I should say that uh, I did a lot of praying in church the next day. That sure. that definitely that Naturally. definitely happened. No Naturally. question. They about wondered it. they wondered why you broke down so fiercely. <laughs> wow, why is Reed the first to the altar? I don't understand. You, just, you, just, you got saved for the fourth time that night. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> um, I think I saw it in college. You know, just as a mm. check it off the bucket list kind of movie. I, I don't. Right, I don't remember right. seeing it before that. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly not a story as lovely as that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But uh, well, what about I, what about uh, as as we usually do? Just some some general kind of likes dislikes. What what you got? I think the biggest thing for me is I think that the the, the I'm I'm so impressed whenever I watch this film about how focused and intentional everything is. One specific thing that I noted this time around is those first ten minutes is like a master class in how you set up an established character and theme. I mean it's it's it those those first 10 minutes are brilliant. In the first 10 minutes we see Clarice pressing herself up through an obstacle course. She meets another character who turns around, reveals the FBI hat. Uh then she passes by a, a tree with the signs on it, you know, hurt and agony and pressing through. Uh she steps into an elevator filled with men. Um, right. you know, but she's the, the lone female in that elevator. And then she goes into, uh, Dr. Crawford's office where she sees the setup, all the stuff on the wall regarding Buffalo Bill, which is one of our primary plot points. And then they have a conversation that leads right into the introduction in the first interview with Hannibal Lecter. That first 10 minutes, I'm serious. Any aspiring screenwriters or filmmakers like study those first 10 minutes for how you effectively set up theme and character and plot seamlessly without needless exposition. Um, we know everything that we need to know about what drives Clarice and what she's up against in those first 10 minutes. And I think it's just brilliant. It's it's absolutely stunning just to just to see how both the screenplay by Ted Talley and Jonathan Demme's direction, they they just do an absolutely masterful job of setting up Clarice as a character and of setting up Lecter as this ominous figure in the... Well, ha- have you... Um, this, the, the answer to this is probably yes, but have you read all of the Thomas Harris stuff? Yes. I've read... Uh, I read Red Dragon. Well, uh, yeah, I should say that. I haven't read everything by Thomas Harris, but I've read well, Silence I mean, of the Lambs. Well, I Hannibal Lecter stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read Red Dragon. I read... Uh, now, I did not read Hannibal Rising. I did not read that one. I, the, the three that I definitely read is I read Red Dragon, I read Silence of the Lambs, and I read um, Hannibal. Red Dragon is, but is really great. the first film version, Manhunter, was that based on a book called Manhunter? Or that's... No, that was based on Red Dragon. So so, oh. Man, so Manhunter is based on Red Dragon, but then Silence of the Lambs was, you know, obviously based on that book, taking the story in a completely different way. The film actually is largely the reason why... Hannibal Lecter is is such a phenomenon because sure, sure. Brian Cox plays him in Manhunter and Manhunter is a very lauded film like it's got some really big fans it's a Michael Mann directed film and it's it's very of the 80s in a lot of ways uh, so it's very dated um, but it's still uh, my memory of it is pretty strong I think it's still pretty effective Brian Cox plays a dramatically Did you see different it on HBO late at night while your parents slept next to you and you know no no, no. there's okay. there, there's nothing there's nothing like Nothing like old Chianti and fava beans while we're, <laughs> while we're right, in the hotel right. room. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, my memory of Manhunter is that I think it's I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, I'm fond of it, but yeah, it it doesn't pack nearly the punch that Silence of the Lambs does. I did not like Hannibal at all, book or movie. I I didn't like oh, either really? of them. Yeah, yeah. Right. The I, I did not like the book. I 
almost hate the movie. So, so yeah, but Silence of the Lambs is really where my affection for this character in this world are anchored. As far as likes, dislikes for me, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there, there, the, the whole movie just has such a creepy tone. I mean, just this. Yeah, it really does. There's just, it, there's just this foreboding kind of sensibility to it the whole time. And a lot of that is just Demi's style, you know, just, just kind of the stylistic stuff he employs. And it's, it's kind of got an interesting structure, wouldn't you say? I mean, I feel like. Oh, definitely. If you don't know anything about the literary origin of Hannibal Lecter, the character, it can, I think it could be a little jarring. Like. I agree. Because ultimately the movie is not about the plot isn't really about Hannibal. Oh, uh, not at all. Right? No, you not know, at all. I mean, it's, it's the pursuit of Buffalo Bill. And so I think for the level of gravity Hopkins brings to the character, I doubt this was the case, but it almost makes you wonder, did they, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't have his, his oeuvre in front of me, so I don't know where in Hopkins career this was. Um, but it almost makes you wonder, like, did they think the Buffalo Bill character and the Hannibal Lecter character were kind of equal in terms of presence on screen? You know what I mean? Like, oh, because, oh. because Buffalo Bill is almost like an afterthought, you know, just in terms of the impact on the overall Sort sure. Of proceedings. Does that yeah. make sense at all? What I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it does. Well, what I what I know, I didn't include this in trivial bits, but what I know is that I know Anthony Hopkins got the role because of his portrayal of of a doctor in The Elephant Man, uh, mm. which was like you know ten years prior. But it was it was his portrayal in The Elephant Man that really made them eyeball him for this role in in Doctor Lecter, which always puzzled him because he said you know that his character in Elephant Man is a really is a good man, is a is a really genuinely good man. And so he's like, why did that put you on for Hannibal Lecter? And I think Jonathan Demme told him, uh, this might be apocryphal, but I think Jonathan Demme told him, he said, well, Hannibal Lecter is a good man. He just happens to eat people. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> like, wow. Like, wow. Well, that's a pretty I big mean, if, you know. Uh, you know, or it's a pretty, bi- pretty big butt. But... <laughs> But like everyone I know has got a big butt. Daddy. <laughs> what's your big butt? <laughs> but I, yeah, I mean, what's fascinating to me about the character of Dr. Lecter is that I think no disrespect to Clarice Starling, which Jodie Foster delivers an anchoring performance. She's wonderful in this. But Hannibal Lecter is just such a such a compelling, mysterious puzzle in this film. Like he is electric in well, and- Hopkins is just so yeah. Compelling. One of one of one of the things I wrote down in my likes dislikes was just that first shot of him. There is a way, and this is a balancing act, and why not that anyone wasn't deserving, but why specifically he was deserving of that award, is y- there is a way that character can become very buffoonish. Not buffoonish Absolutely. in a dumb way, but in a in a clownish, you know, mustache twirling Pennywise kind of way when it's not really intended to be there. And he plays it very close to the vest, despite its more exaggerative expressions. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, I definitely agree. He plays it very restrained. It's interesting because, and this is probably going to be rather known to big fans of this film, but the voice that he uses is uh, actually an intonation of HAL 9000 from 2001 Space Odyssey. Have you ever seen 2001 Space Odyssey? Pieces of it. And it's it's uh, the, the voice affectation that he puts on yeah. is very much trying to be very mechanical, robotic, got that that smooth lilt to it, which I think fits the character so perfectly because, sure. the, you know, they say in the film that the character's pulse never rises, that it's, you know, he's very even, methodical type of character. But yeah, I mean, uh, Hopkins is, he's brilliant in this. He embodies the role in a, in a way that I, I don't know if anybody else would. No disrespect to Brian Cox, who played the role, but, but Hannah, I mean, Hopkins brings something quite substantial to this that I think, I think it's obvious why he's so indelibly linked with that character now. The, my final like, and actually, this may be on yours, so I may have to, uh, I, I, I may have to yield to you, but the sequence, the, the fake out sequence, Near the end right. of the film, that is so masterfully done, where yeah. you see both of them sort of, you see Buffalo Bill in there hearing the doorbell ring while you're seeing the FBI yeah. converge on the home. And at first, when I first watched it, I was like, wait, what? Like, was this bad editing? What just happened? But no, right. in fact, it's 
brilliant Perfect editing. Perfect editing. Yes. Right. Um, because they just they just faked you out. Delete fake out <laughs> from likes and dislikes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You got to start going first on likes, dislikes. Right, right, so right, right. Happen. I'm just deferential. Um, I'm just, you're my friend. I, um, no, my, my last like dislike is just Kevin Garvey Sr., you know, uh, (laughs) good old Scott Glenn. (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, one thing that I, I do have as a dislike and it is a dislike Uh is, uh, I'm sorry, but Buffalo Bill's dance scene that we've alluded to a couple of times. (laughs) Good God. I can't, I I mean, is that a dislike objectively like of a technical sort of just a, you're just put off by it. It is so immensely uncomfortable. You've never seen a grown man dance. (laughs) It is. No, I have not. Nor do I want to. I didn't want to in this movie. Like, good lord. That is just... Do you know that scene wasn't in the screenplay? So, okay. Really? So, that that scene was not in the screenplay. It is in the novel. That scene was not in the screenplay. It was in the novel. Ted Levine, the actor, insisted that that, that be in the movie because he said it was so important for understanding this Buffalo Bill character. And I'm like... Man, dude, I'm glad you seem like a really good guy because otherwise I would not want to be in the same room with you. Like, well, and it's so, it's so like, pardon the, the momentary crudeness here, but I love how in the way the scene's shot, he just tucks his pet mouse away off screen and, and then just backs up and here we are. With oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> Listeners can't see my face. <laughs> <in> the <laughs> severe <laughs> amount of grimaces. I it's so, like, good lord. If you want to know what that's a reference to, listen to last week's episode. Um, but oh yeah, I mean, he, he just, he just gets into it. Hey, you know, let the man. No. You know, he, in 2017, no, 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 no. he'd be totally good. You know, it's <laughs> 1991 that just won't have him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's just so, yeah, it's, it, it, well, and, it's not only just like the dancing itself, because we're only talking about like those elements, but he's he's wearing a person like it like like that's that's the thing that like gets. It's not just the dancing. It's not just that pet mouse thing. It's he's <laughs> he's wearing a person. He's wearing a human being like I got it. OK, so I got to say this. I was I didn't know whether to include this in scares or themes or everything. I'll mention it here like. I'll mention it here because I'm not going to bog themes down with it because I have no idea what to say about this. It just stood out to me in this viewing of the film. So, quick little disclaimer. We are a show about the intersection between the Christianity and the horror genre. So, I'm watching the film and as of all things, the scripture verse that comes out in my mind, it's not the scripture verse I'm going to use for themes, but the scripture verse that comes out in my mind was the consider the lilies of the field, like don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. And I'm sitting here, I found something absurdly profane. I mean, genuinely very profane about the fact of like that whole idea of don't worry about food and don't worry about clothing and the fact that Hannibal Lecter uses people as food and Buffalo Bill uses people as clothing. Like it just, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting, you know, I mean, it just, yeah. like I said, I don't even know what I want to say about it, except just that, like, it stood out to me, and I was just like, whoa. It just, yeah, it just creeped yeah, the me Lord's, out. Yeah, the Lord's going to provide for you, oh, no, my. Matter your, no matter your proclivities. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, need oh, to, I need to pray man. for some forgiveness on that. We're skirting close to heresy. No um, kidding. So, on that note, so, yes, apparently Buffalo Bill in Toto is on your scary list. Um, oh, yes. No question. Um, so other scares, since we're segueing now, um, as off-putting and unsettling as a man in a robe wearing a lady is, <laughs> oh my God. which is like, what a sentence, what a sentence there. Like just a, a step above that and scariness. And like, like if you were to say, if you were to describe the Buffalo Bill character to me, okay, so there's a dude, he's in a robe and nothing else. And he's wearing a lady and he's dancing. And I'd be like, oh, that's gross. And you're like, well, what's grosser? I'd say a friggin' bug cocoon stuck in your throat yep. after you're dead. That's it. Yep. That's what I would describe. I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's worse. <laughs> yes. That is infinitely worse. Oh. That is so gross and nauseating. Read my, I've learned in my 37 years of life, my 13 years of marriage, my eight now years of fatherhood, like I've had to steal myself against bugs and critters that generally do just put me off in a real trauma traumatizing way but man no roaches like big guys 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. Okay. I remember. See, this is probably me at thirteen. I wasn't watching stuff I shouldn't. <laughs> uh, but I remember being at home by myself, and there's a roach on the wall. And we lived in squalor. No, we did. We really <laughs> did. We really did. <laughs> it was but hard I times. Just, it was hard times. Right, 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 right. I just, and I got real hungry. No, that's not where this story goes. Um, but I, I just have this memory, you know, as houses occasionally do, having critters in them, um, of this giant roach on the wall and me prepping my shoe or magazine or whatever I'm going to use to dispense with it. And what does it do? It crawls it up fly- your arm. No, it flies towards me uh-uh. and skims my head. Nope, 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 it nope, is- nope, nope. Exactly. Nope, nope, it nope, is- nope, nope. To this day, I have roach-like nightmares and stuff. Uh, yes. Um, oh, my gosh. They're so, so, yeah, that specific cool. moment is probably one of the scariest scenes in the movie for me. That's wow. Disgusting. Well, I, un- I understand. I understand. I will say, I mentioned it earlier... <laughs> Partially because I saw it in a in a hotel room uh, when I was only thirteen years old, but man, Hannibal Lecter's entire escape that is that is yeah. pure that yeah. is pure nightmare. Like that entire sequence, beginning when they are bringing him the food, culminating in him in the ambulance. Uh, it is pure, unfiltered nightmare. Well, and, you know, it's fun about uh, when I just watched it for the for the show. So having seen it years ago, I didn't, I, you know, as, as happens, like if you've seen a movie once and you watch it years later, like I couldn't remember every little beat in it. I knew there was some form of breakout, but I didn't remember him embodying someone else. Oh, yes. So, right. <clears throat> so as I'm watching it, they're in the elevator and I was like, oh, yeah. Oh you know, that gosh. this revelation happens of yeah, like, that's yeah. right. That's what's about to happen. Oh, uh, good that's Lord. such an ex- expertly uh, executed sequence there. Certainly. Um, and I, I think, I think, um, you know, honestly, uh, Hannibal Lecter is monstrous in his own right. I think the character of Chilton is one of the scariest elements in this movie. He's, He's so, so creepy. Disgusting. Yeah, he really is. He's slimy. Um, and then and he's like a roach that flies at you and skims your head. Oh. Um, and, and then you die and he's in your throat. Um, oh. I, know, I know it's just everywhere. My last sort of scary element was just the cat and mouse through Buffalo Bill's house. I mean, oh, yes. Yes. The night vision goggles scene. Yeah, I will, yeah. I will say that as effective as that is as a suspense moment, every single time I've seen it, I, I ding the film down a little bit. I find it difficult to believe that he wouldn't just take her out. Now, maybe that's just me. Maybe other fans will be like, of course, it's consistent with his character and everything. Like, okay, I get it. Um, but I watch that scene and I'm like, man, she would have been gone easily. Two well, he's got to be, he's got to be careful, careful how he takes them out, you know, because he's got to wear them at a certain point. So Oof. he can't just damage, damage the goods, unduly damage them. No. That's all I got for scares, Reed. Yeah. Well, that's, that's plenty. Um, <laughs> the, but I think, you know, there's a variety of different places that you could go with themes for this. A couple of things that stood out for me. I'll talk. I'll talk about the first one, and then you know might might bleed into the second one, or might bounce back to you. But it stuck out to me in this viewing of the film how many hidden agendas are in the the network of the film. Like I'm going to kind of focus on the three main characters: Buffalo Bill, Hannibal Lecter, Clary Starling. But even like Jack Crawford sends Clarice to interview Hannibal Lecter with the mindset that maybe something will happen regarding Buffalo Bill, but he doesn't tell her that. You know, he sort of draws her in and gets her invested sort of on this other wavelength. Hannibal Lecter is cooperating with her all the while masterminding his escape. And then also, you know, there's Buffalo Bill who obviously pretends to be uh, impaired, and then that's how he kidnaps these girls, or at least that's how he kidnaps the one in this film. We would presume he would do that. He's done that other times. Um, and then even Clarice, who on the surface is genuinely trying to get Buffalo Bill, but there's this constant undercurrent of her own advancement and what, you know, the title of the film. There's a reason the film is called The Silence of the Lambs is because that's what she's constantly trying to achieve, is the the ceasing of that drive that has brought her out of her hometown and into the FBI to begin with. Um, And so there's this constant theme that I was picking up and specifically this viewing of people who will say a thing 
and accomplish a certain goal. And all the while, they've got something subtextual that they're trying to accomplish and trying to to make happen. And nearly everybody in the film succeeds in their supposed hidden agenda. Nearly everybody does. Hannibal Lecter genuinely does escape. Clarice genuinely catches Buffalo Bill. You know, Buffalo Bill does kidnap Catherine, even though he doesn't ultimately get to do to her what he had done to so many other victims. But that just that just stuck out to me that uh, that characters were being inherently deceitful and how much deceit was in the in the film, even in Jonathan Demme deceiving us with that final FBI break in sequence. So anyway, that you know, I have more to say about that can I t- tied to my second theme, but that was one thing that jumped out to me is just the idea of of hidden and subtextual agendas throughout the film. What did you have either in response to that or on your own? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my my rebut to yours will will segue perhaps into mine. I I would contend that she is not uh, a participant in deception per se. Now at least not in a subtextual kind of way. She does at a certain point present, you know, that false sort of pardon for oh, Hannibal. Right, um, right. So yes, there's a sense of deception there, but in terms of what you're talking about, which feels like a bit more sinister, I don't necessarily think she participates in that. Uh, it's funny, you, you and I texted today and I was a, a bit stumped at a moment and just time had not really permitted me to sit down and really, really put some thoughts on paper. And I ended up writing a whole lot here. So this is a bit robust, but I was sort of taken this time around with this is an extremely, to me, feminist movie like Mm. this. Mm -hmm. There's there's so much going on. So just kind of bullet points. I mean, the opening shot is the opening scene is Clarice alone against the elements. So she's by herself. Uh, She's against the elements and, and she's. She's succeeding. She's overcoming what she's going after. Physically, Jodie Foster is tiny compared to these everyone around her. Yes. Um, it emphasizes to me that sort of emphasizes her place in the world. You know, uh, yeah. that she is in the world that she occupies. You know, she is the only, well, the only female character of note that I mean, you know, the only ones that are coming to mind are her, or the sort of. Uh, the African American sort of peer or student, fellow student, classmate. I think it's her, her roommate. And then, okay. And yeah. then Catherine is it, the woman who has been, yeah. you know, taking a Buffalo Bill. So the roommate is really just there as sort of set dressing. It feels like in places she doesn't have a fully fleshed out character. Um, so, so in terms of the feminine element in the movie, you've got Jodie Foster, Clarice, and you've got Catherine who's stuck in a well and has been abducted. Um, so, you know, there's a very specific, very limited perspective of women in the movie and, and sort of where they fall. And one is a captive. So, so that is interesting. And it's funny. I, it's been years since I've seen Philadelphia. So I didn't yeah. have like a, a counterpoint in terms of Demi's style, but the, the style of this movie just really stood out to me this go round. Like it's almost strange at first glance these low shots, these low perspective shots from her. But again, it's, you know, these, some of these lower shots and again, emphasize and reiterate that role in her, in the pecking order. Right. I mean, she is right. very low on the totem pole. I mean, she's a student, right? She's not. No, she's a, a stu- full fledged yeah. agent. Yeah, yeah. She's a student. She's not an FBI agent. Yeah. You know, all this stuff, it's, it's weird when you're watching it, but it makes sense to me in this through line, these scenes where, she enters a room where men are and they just start making faces, mm. you know, like yeah. they're sneering, you know, the, the, the moment where I don't remember exactly what happens, but either, uh, Scott Glenn excuses her or excuses himself and another superior, you know, like bas- clearly right. is right. drawing some line between what you're allowed to participate in and what everyone else is. Yes. The, to the sense that it almost beats you over the head with it. Mm-hmm. The style to me. It just keeps coming back. Uh, the style is so substantive. And, and again, I, I, I apologize for this earlier, not to be crude here, but like the scene with the cell mate that. Oh, multiple hurls, mates. Yeah. Yeah. Hurls ejaculate at her, mm-hmm. which I mean is, is as male a, a concept as is possible. Yeah. Right. Is sort of a metaphor for this whole movie. Like, I mean, this, this victimization of women on one hand, 
uh, sort of the realization of this one particular woman in Clarice, on the other hand. Right. All right. of the male characters really, and, and I actually was going to exclude Hannibal, but you just made the point a minute ago where he's constantly working for his own escape. But so all of the male right. characters are kind of using her. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's the implication that Scott Glenn's character is romantically attracted to her. Yes. Like she just doesn't, she doesn't exist in this movie outside of these forces. Mm -hmm. And, and it's funny because like, I know I'm just rattling on, but I'm, I'm trying to draw this somewhere. I went and reread the script sequence where the title of the movie comes from. And, and I took a different interpretation than what you just laid out. Oh, but, interesting. Um, you know, so the, she's talking about the screams of these lambs and right. how in the middle of the night she goes, she opens the pen and the, and the, the line is actually, they just stood there confused. They wouldn't run. Mm. And, and while, yes, yeah, she's a female in this movie, I kept thinking as I was processing all of this, like, that is what happens when we lock people into systems of oppression. Mm. They, they don't know what to do with freedom, right? Wow. I mean, she is trying to push against the, the bubble of, of the culture, the society, the vocation that she's in. Right. She's trying to be the, the, a, a liberator, you yeah. know, trying to find Catherine, you know, but there's this way in which I, I don't know that, that story just really rung out to me because even when the, in, in watching the movie, when the phrase, the silence of the, the story starts getting told. Right. You know, right. there's, there's this sort of like, okay, this is about important. the halfway mark. Yeah. This is important. This is important. So I was really trying to pay attention. I was really processing it. I had to go back and reread the script and I was like, this is sort of what this is about to me thematically is that we are called to facilitate others freedom, mm. right? To, to mm. this, because, because there's a way in which the silence of the lambs as a phrase has this ominous sort of sound. Yeah. Right. But really it's pacifying them, right? It's not silencing by death. The, the lambs are screaming because they're, they are to be killed. She ta she wants to take run and one and run with it. Like mm -hmm. she wants to silence them. She wants to quiet them. Well, in a certain way, that happens ultimately because she gets free with one. Right, right. So there's a way. I mean, I think I think there's an interpretive way you could say, okay, the silence of the lambs is silencing of the lambs. I'm you know killing a creature. But to right. me, there's a way, and there's a there's more a way in which, at least in the interpretation I'm trying to draw from it here, where the silence of the lambs, as it were, is a pacifying, is a bringing peace to a scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm. Does that make yeah. sense? Oh, it de it definitely does. Well, and it resonates. Uh, I can't remember if you may if you drew this direct distinction or if I just connected the dots in my mind. But that's that's becomes what her efforts are in the uh, in the saving of Catherine is to is to free to free her directly. Uh, that's sure. that's narrative. But she definitely is directly. One would even say probably solely responsible for Catherine being saved and Catherine being free. Right. Um, yeah, I don't think you're off in that. Uh, like it, it, it is, it is an interesting interpretation. And I think it's, that's indicative of the diff, the, the complexity of this film and the complexity. Of well, the I, th I don't think I would fight so hard for it, except it is so significant that she is, you know, it's, it's her diminutive stature. It's her gender in the face of, everyone not being her gender it is you know this particular killer abducts and uh dissects and uh enrobes himself with you know what i mean like the the, right, the gender right. sort of conversation is all over this movie whether you say want to say it's not you specifically but whether someone wants to say oh it's all about the hannibal lecter stuff period like this movie is having a conversation about gender and power and, yes. and, and in fact, how I sort of tied off this sort of thematic stuff, and then I'm happy to defer to you, is like, it made me think of Sixth Sense in a, in a different sort of way, but I feel like there's a theme here to be found of seeing the unseen people around us. Like, the fact that the screen, that the camera angle is first person and is on the faces of these men, coworkers and peers sneering at her, but the context of the movie doesn't pass judgment on them. Does that right. make sense? Oh yes. Whereas no, you are, you as a viewer are like, what is up? 
That's in other weird, words, to right. me, that's a thematic sort of statement. Like mm. she, she is having to fight to be seen, to be heard, to be given credibility in this particular world she lives in. And I think, right. I think again, I'm, I'm going to keep walking this out. Like women, people of color, you know, have to work so hard in their vocations, in their lives to be seen. And, and, yeah. and, you know, as, as two white 30 something men sitting here, which just feels all sorts of bad, but you know, too many men, too many white men, too many white evangelical men are participants in the suppression of these people groups. We are the ones putting the screaming lambs in the pen, you know? Mm, um, mm-hmm. I mean, it made me think like, this is really getting testy perhaps, but the whole, uh, a couple weeks ago, the whole Mike Pence story about his wife and, and being present with a woman somewhere, just the two of them. Do you remember? Oh, you see this? yeah. Where they were bringing up the Billy Graham rule where they were not allowed. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah. 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 Where, yeah. Which, which might have a context and cer- might have a, an, an appropriateness in certain contexts. I think when you are the second most powerful person in the world, like we need to set aside some of these things because what all you're doing to me is just further entrenching these exact systems of power that Mm. say, oh, well, I can't be with, I can't be present. You know, Angela Merkel, oh, you're in town from Germany. You're the head of that country. Right. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the due respect and credit you deserve because I'm not going to permit myself to be alone with you you know like it's just kind of silly and reinforces things that really should not be reinforced yeah yeah well and and what that makes me think of specifically is it makes me think of what we what our real value is because when i hear that do you mean do you mean what what do we value or as in what value we own at what we possess what do we cherish as conviction and value Sure. Um, not what our inherent worth is as people, okay, but right. what do we hold dear? Um, and I think about that and on, on the surface, and, and this is an interesting sort of, sort of side trail, but I'll follow it for a moment that what I think about on the surface when I hear that is there is a way in which someone could say that idea is, uh, for the mutual protection of all people concerned. When in reality, I think, if we were really honest, it's about protection of reputation. If we were really honest, that general sort of idea, I think about Joseph uh, from from the Bible. I think about Joseph who, you know, was dramatically falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of doing heinous things. And, and the, the biblical text calls out that he did nothing but right. was accused of this thing, thrown in prison for it. All of all of that sort of story. Go check out Genesis if you're if you're not familiar with the story that I'm referring to. And so I think about that and I think about, you know, Joseph in that situation and any situation he was in had the conviction and would and and held to his convictions, regardless, regardless of what scenario he was in. He was alone with Potiphar, clearly was alone with Potiphar's wife multiple times, but held fast to his convictions. Where I'm going with that is this. We would say, oh, we're we're protecting ourselves, but I think it's a fine line between protecting yourself and protecting your reputation. And I think sure. that's where we need to be intensely honest with ourselves and with those around us about where we draw the line and what we really value. Um, there, I think I would have, and maybe he has, I don't know, I think I would have respect for somebody who said, like, I, I just can't, I can't risk my reputation. I can't risk something happen to my reputation. I think... Odd as it may sound, I might have a good deal of respect for somebody who was just that honest about why they had that in line, where they said, like, no, I'm just my reputation is what is important to me. The appearance of things is what's important to me. And so that's why I well, don't, but don't you. But don't you. But isn't isn't there isn't there a way in which that sort of statement, honest or not, is basically propping up a Potiphar's wife scenario? Like you're basically saying Either you're either saying I don't trust this woman, or uh, you're saying yes. I don't trust myself. You know, because I think now, hear me. Like I'm not trying to be like, oh, you should put yourself in every conceivable situation because the sure. Lord emboldens you to. And like, I think if you sincerely have a problem uh, being in the presence of the opposite sex, you need therapy um, to figure out where that's coming from because that's not whole. <laughs> or right. you know what I mean? That's not a, that's not an appropriate sort of 
thought pattern to, right. to let dominate yourself. Sure. Um, there's a whole host of conversation that we could have about like the, the cultural factors that contribute to our perception and, and attitude towards opposite sex. Um, right. but I, I can't get away from like, it's funny, you know, is it, is it because I don't like our current administration and why I'm more hard on the, the quote unquote Billy Graham rule against Mike Pence or is it, is it the actual rule itself? I think there was a version of me 15 years ago who would have been extremely sympathetic to this. And I do think there's a way in which you just are, have to be like smart in your life, uh, especially yes. for people who are in a major spotlight. But I, but at the same time, <sighs> I mean, come on, like if, if we are not going to be like Jesus in all things, like, mm -hmm. like we, we do need to recognize human frailty in our own self, you know, whether that's temptation or, you know, just, just general sort of laziness, whatever, you know, however you want to contextualize that. But, you know, the New Testament is riddled. Uh, the gospels are riddled with accounts of Jesus, uh, emboldening and uplifting and making equal a woman in a story. Oh, you know, absolutely. The, wo the woman no at the well, uh, the woman called in adultery. You know, this, yes. this is a system of power saying, setting itself against her in mm -hmm. your words, not that you were arguing this, but in your words for reputation. Oh, yeah. The, the woman... You are going to sully our reputation by your misdeeds. So we are going to stone you. Right. And so your... Jesus will. Yeah. Hold your thought. I just want to insert the example that I think most illustrative of your point is the prostitute who breaks into the Pharisee's home to pour oil over Jesus' right. feet. Like that was yeah. going to be my next one. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> that's it's all delete. Good. It's all good. Nathan right. deletes. But, but <laughs> <laughs> this whole episode, you just keep stealing all the good stuff. It's right there. I think smart things too. Um, <laughs> me talk pretty one day. Um, but. But well, it's that, and also um, I was thinking of two of the woman uh, with the issue of blood who reaches out and touches yes. him in his robe. Yes, you know, like like I don't know, man. I think I just think, and and again, like what what listeners may be hearing in my passion, what you may be registering, and and like I I I am the father of three daughters. Like I am extremely passionate about the fact that our systems of oppression don't get to determine the value of my children. Oh, and, right. and, and the example of Jesus, if it does anything, it says there is nothing that, uh, will prohibit a full experience of life and personhood by them. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I just think there's a way that it, it was fascinating to me as I assessed this movie. Like, I, am I bringing my own stuff to it? Clearly there's some of that, but I also think there's a lot going on in this movie about the conversation of, gender and power roles and power dynamics, oh, yeah. um, you know, that, that kind of can't be ignored if you just really assess it anyway. Yeah. Well, and to, to further solidify what you're saying, I keep thinking, and I can't remember if you mentioned this or not. I don't think you did. Um, let's not forget that even though it ultimately holds only marginal plot significance, Catherine successfully devises a plan to kidnap that, to, to bring that dog down into the well. Right. Right. And, and gains, for a moment, power over Bill in doing so. And right. and so I don't think you're far afield from what Jonathan Demme was exploring and even what Thomas Harris was exploring in his story ab about gender role and gender appropriation. I do want to say, not to argue your point, but for the sake of listeners out there who, who might genuinely have some struggles with this. I, I had a friend. Are you, uh, well, are you saying, are you saying you don't want to argue my point, meaning you, you're going to argue and substantiate or argue against it? Just so I understand what I'm prepare for right now. <laughs> sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to present the other side of the fence as well as I can without being combative because I agree with your point. Sure. So the, the other side of that fence is I, I have a dear friend who I will not even come close to naming, even context of how I know them, who several years ago, was in a situation where they were continually feeling compromised by a member of the opposite sex. Um, my friend was a guy and they were, they were being very flirted with by a member of the opposite sex with whom their situation necessitated that they frequently had to be alone. They were made very uncomfortable by this. And it was not something that they could get a lot of substantial uh, response to because a guy Talking about being made uncomfortable by the flirtations of a woman in, you know, the early aughts uh, was was laughable 
to a lot of people. But he was like, sincerely, like, I'm I'm not comfortable being alone with this with this woman was often talked down, was often dismissed. And sure enough, situations progressed to a degree where I'm going to say this as sensitively as I can. uh, Some impropriety happened and he took nearly all of the fall for it and took nearly all of the blame for it. Uh, Not by his choice. He tried to express what what had really happened, but it is something like just again to express the other side of the fence. I I just want to say that there is a certain degree to which you do have to be protective of what you if, if you find yourself in a situation that, you know, is eroding and that, you know, just just your own boundaries, male, female, uh, whatever gender orientation or appropriation you are. That if you find yourself in a situation that you are not comfortable or you are not safe, you should feel empowered. And I think this is your point, that you should sure. feel empowered to to say, I, I cannot continue this situation. Like, I can't continue to be in this this role or in this position. I have a certain well, degree of... I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off there. I was no, just going to say, like, I don't want it to be misconstrued, like... I think there's an exception to every rule and and I'm sure. simply trying to make the case that more often than not to to use a Brian Stevenson phrase our, our dear friend um you know presumption of guilt I think more yeah. often than not a a dominant uh strata of of culture in most cases in our world white men uh of the older variety are naturally going to get a presumption of innocence in a scenario where something like this happens. Now, yeah, I mean, the, the example you're laying out, I mean, you know, who, who knows exactly there and, and, and perhaps this other person, this woman was truly in the wrong. I, I'm not arguing that that is false or wrong or sure. naturally he should take the fall for, for impropriety that was, uh, you know, between the two of them. I'm simply trying to make the case that it's a dangerous and slippery slope when that presumption of guilt becomes inherent and unseen by us you know what i mean right, like right 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 when i just sort of naturally act out of it not realizing oh wait a minute I, i'm i'm sort of acting in a way that presumes something bad is going to happen when that's not at all because because then this person doesn't become a person anymore right it becomes right. it becomes an obstacle to my reputation to use the word mm-hmm. you used right you know and i, I just think that's dangerous anyway yeah, and I think it's important that we I think it's vitally important and this something this is something to tie explicitly back into the themes of Silence of the Lambs of of the humanizing of people. I had mentioned almost in brief about how upsetting it was for me to register that Lecter sees people as as little more than meat. Not everybody, clearly he doesn't see Clarice that way, but he sees people as little more than meat and and bill is seeing people again to to harken back to your conversation about means and ends uh he sees them as a, as a means to his own transformation and to his own sure. sort of uh what he's trying to enact in in his own in his own self but i think that the antidote for that and the, and i think it's the antidote to the problem that you're articulating regarding our political demographics our social demographics is you have to see people as people they're right. people and and that applies to the situation that i laid out about a guy you know you, you you pass people could easily have a presumption of guilt on oh well he's a guy so naturally something else was going on well I, from my conversations with the man that wasn't true but sure. but there's stigmas attached to everything and what you have to do right. and we've said this before on the show is you have to see people as people and you have to treat people with the respect and with the concerns that they are warranted and that are and that are met, guys are not inherently pigs. They're not. I, I can't stand that that statement. Women are not inherently fill in the blank. They're not. Right. The the, the myriad the the vast spectrum of what individuals, regardless of gender or race or um, uh, demographic orientation, whatever it is, they fall on any degree of the spectrum. And you have to right. see people as people and you have to be very discerning about the individual with which you're engaging. And and I think that's something that is present 
in the film. What does the the senator say when she's trying to get Buffalo Bill to release her daughter? She repeatedly says the name Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. Right. And right. they call out in the film that yeah, that she's trying humanizing. to humanize Catherine. And I think that's I think that's important. I think there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of complicity with the audience in the fact that we find Lecter a kind of a cool character. That right. he's very disturbing yeah. and very upsetting, but at the same time, there's there's a little bit of a satisfaction when he escapes. It's horrendous and horrific, and as I mentioned earlier, it's the stuff of nightmare. But there's a little bit of a wow. How I, I would venture to say, listeners right now who think I might be scratching at something uh, erroneous or in error, think about your reaction when you hear his line, "I'm having an old friend for dinner." Just just articulate right, your reaction right. when you hear at the end of the film. When he says, I'm having an old friend for dinner, are you horrified and run screaming out of the room? Or is there a slight smirk edging up at the edge of your of your mouth as you realize that he's gotten away and he's going to get Chilton, which we've already said. Now, is, if you're if you're if you're salivating, then we're getting worried. You know? Then we're then we're in trouble. <laughs> right, <laughs> we're right. in real trouble. But but what I'm saying is that there's a complicity there that's happening. And one of the things that I think is 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 imperative is and and I'm I'm not trying to backdoor into the other theme that I was going to have it really I really am finding a connection here with what you're saying the the liberation of people the um the 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 setting the captives free the seeing people as people kind of thing I think that there needs to be a dramatic and profound transformation in our way of thinking about different demographics race gender class uh financial station uh where you're from geographic location i think there needs to be a dramatic transformation in how we even approach the conversation let alone approach the people who would apply to that conversation you have to be willing to to look at a person and be willing to engage them on a completely different on a completely different level than what you're accustomed to engaging them with and i think that transformation is not automatic and it's not natural i think we have to be intentional about it and and where i'm going with that is that transformation was the sort of the second thing that i saw laced throughout the the role of this film the disgusting moment that you mentioned about the moth they call out in the film that that is indicative of transformation which is what bill is trying to do he's trying sure. to transform himself hannibal lecter is trying to transform his situation uh, his circumstances. There's there's all this idea of of becoming something else, becoming free, becoming you know, uh, Bill appropriating this different identity that he wants to to put on, albeit in a very twisted and sick way. But this idea of transformation and what it what it brought to mind of scriptures, and I'm going to try my best to wrap a bow on this entire very robust conversation that we're having. The scripture that I thought of for this was Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. It says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And what I will say that I'm gleaming sort of, you know, tying this all together is this idea of we have to have a new way of thinking. We have to have some new approach to how we treat human beings, how we treat issues, how we approach problem solving, how we deal with criminals, how we deal with peers, whether that be sort of stepping out of the box and and maybe getting a little risky at the moment. You know, to speak specifically to the Mike Pence thing, maybe that means, hey, this person is a flesh and blood human being that deserves my respect. And it's a little disrespectful for me to categorize them as merely a woman. And I'm using that language deliberately. Right, right, right. To categorize someone as merely a woman instead of with the station with which they they deserved to to be in. And you may disagree, you know, audience listening audience may disagree with me. They may really have uh, they really have a profound agreement with with Pence's stance with that rule I, we want to hear from you if that's your case we want to we want to hear what you have to say about that but, but let I, me jump in there real let me jump in there real quick because I, I i want it to be clear too because i got so impassioned there but i want it to be clear too i am not saying live recklessly as mm. a believer 
Um, right. And I, I feel like we, we beat that drum pretty regularly around here. But, you know, I do think, I think, I think, you, you know, you, you've, the, the scripture you just used is, is utilizing the language of, of newness, renewal. Um, I, I think so much. And there was some situation un, totally unrelated to the podcast and this movie today, but made me think of the, the, um, new wine and old wineskin sort of idea. There is a way in which the rigidity that we have imposed as the evangelical church onto our operating in the world and how we try to apply that to those who aren't in that cultural sphere is just a uh, strong word here. Simple. It is just simple. Like you, you, yeah. you, you, because I think Jesus does not operate under the rigidity we want him to. Right. And that's why we kill him. Yes. I mean, really? Like, yes. you know, I, I know it feels like, well, Nathan, you're really like, where, where, where is this coming from? Where is this going? I just think I see things like this Mike Pence thing and hear me, listener, hear me read, hear me, Lord. Like, I'm sure Mike Pence is, I know Mike Pence is dearly loved by the Lord, but I think the things that we see in that sort of sector and that sort of sphere, well, I can't do this. And we back that up with some sort of faux religiosity, this faux Christianity. To me, that's the horror. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you want to talk about the intersection of horror and faith, it's that. It's yes. somehow trying to justify our rigid, robotic kind of way that we've culturally appropriated Jesus and scripture that is not at all Jesus and scripture. Right. No, I agree. You know. I think Jesus would say to everyone who wants to follow him wholly and faithfully, be sensitive and be conscientious and don't be stupid, but do not be rigid. You know, yes. that, oh, yeah. that, the, that, the, that newness cannot exist in rigidity. And, and if, if there's any sort of, um, uh, uh, application of this renewal of the mind, this, this, I feel like there's a way in which uh, scripture calls us to constant renewal. Like you, you, you are, you are not meant to, okay, well, this is how I think. And that's how I'm going to think. And this is how I'm going to behave in light of what I think from here until I die. Like that to me is not faithful interpretation. You know, it is renewal. It is, it is you, because the, the day you are new wine, the next day you're an old wine skin and it, Mm -hmm. and it, cause it, you know, it, it calls you to constant renewal. I'm just going all over the place right here. Yeah. Look at this. Do it. I'm just, I know. Do it. I mean, I, I don't know. I, stuff like that just, it, it, it disheartens me. It makes me sad. I think it, I think it doesn't break Jesus's heart that you want to be sensible. I right. think it breaks Jesus's heart that your sensibility is used as a weapon to oppress others and to make them feel less than. I agree. That's I what agree. I think. And, and I, I totally cut you off. No, so, no, no. Uh, well, to, to, to bring it back around with a scripture that I probably should have used to begin with, because the name of the film is The Silence of the Lambs, your recent uh, preaching there made me think of Matthew eighteen twelve, which says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for that one that wandered off? What that says to me in, in this is you always, Jesus is always more concerned about the one and rescuing the one than he is about staying safe at home with the 99 and staying to use your word rigid in this little pen. Like, nope, we're good. One is collateral damage and acceptable loss, but that's not the mode that Christ right. gives us. That's right. not faithful living. Faithful living is to to go back to your uh, to to rescue the lamb, <laughs> you know, to, right. to and you know we we use language that Jesus is the lamb, but yeah, to to go to wander out and to find that one. I've said I think I've said it before on the show. I know I've said it on social media that I said that you know I profoundly believe. Whatever you think is going on in the political or social spectrum right now, I profoundly believe that one day the Good Shepherd will return and that when he does, he will be carrying in his arms every single one that the 99 have been convincing themselves that he doesn't care about. I deeply believe that. I yeah. I feel that is 
a profound understanding we need to grasp when we're trying to understand kingdom living and we try to understand who that good shepherd really is to us and to his people. Um, so yeah, amen to, to all of that that you said. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, so we've had a, a big, you know, probably sermonizing altar call conversation. Cause see, that's what happens is that after you watch silence of the lambs, then you go to church the next day. That's been my experience. Um, <laughs> at least. um but, um, but now do you want to, do you want to sort of liven things and lighten things up as we, as we near the tarmac for home and, and what if I just old... like, what if I just went off again? You'd be like, oh my... wow. I'd be like, just... wow, man, <laughs> we're sitting here two and a half hours later. Nathan's like, <laughs> and another thing. <laughs> and another thing. <laughs> oh, you sons of, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, sons of thunder. Um, yes. To let me switch my brain a bit. <laughs> Woo, come down off the mountain. That's um, right. With the sheep in your uh, Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, like. Uh, oh, know, I did it again. I, I laid up the did, fire. You did. I did. I, started I mean, you, it just, you, you threw coal back in the fire. You're like. <laughs> it just the starts amber. flaming up again. Because, oh, I, I, you know, I, uh, exclusivity, man. It's it's sin and it's abomination. Um, yes. So speaking of abominations, um, every week to <laughs> to to categorize, to quantify, uh, to classify the movies that we imbibe and intake and digest, we use a very serious, very staid metric um, that many have found boring, um, but we think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and we use, we specifically use, um, Mr. Tom Hanks character, David S. Pumpkins off of Saturday Night Live from, uh, October right. 2016. Man, I really hope he reprises that role this year. That's, that'd be glorious. Oh, um, I know. If, 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 you know, if the world is still standing, knowing how much SNL loves to uh, get in the hot seat these days. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> So yes, using our David S. Pumpkins metric, um, we like to assess the movies we discuss, the content we discuss on three specific categories, that being style, that being scares, and that being substance. Um, and we use this on, uh, numbers of David S. Pumpkins, uh, ranking zero to five, uh, with halvesies included. We just, we like to give every opportunity. Um, every, yes, possible. a thorough examination. So, so Reed, in the David S. Pumpkins category of style, uh, zero to five, how do you rank Jonathan Demme's The Silence of the Lambs? Big shocker here. I'm going to give it a big fat five. It is a wonderful, fascinating, exquisitely well-crafted film. Uh, yeah, a definite substantial five. I am actually, uh, it may surprise you, going to give it a four. Uh, uh -huh. I, I, I think that um, I tend to categorize style as a sort of likability scale, which doesn't mean I'm about to set up that I don't like Science of the Lambs. Four out of five is still pretty robust. Um, but I do think even the things that I find technically skillful in terms of the style, the actual style of the shooting, is a little odd and a little jarring um, mm. in a way that... Anyway, so I'm going to give it four. I'm going to quit apologizing for it all right no no and you shouldn't um, so uh on uh ne after style we do uh scares read yes. um i'm gonna start with scares because you started with style go right ahead um i would say it's it's easy to to categorize this um do i want four and a half or do i want five i mean like he is so formidable as a presence mm -hmm. um I'll go five. I'll be, I'll be, all right. I'll offset my style a little bit because I know you were disappointed there, but uh, <laughs> I'll do a five. On, no, on no, no, no. It, it's your rating. The only ones that, the only time that you've ever disappointed me with your ratings was The Exorcist. We're going to redo those some days, but, <laughs> um, but no. So, so me it may surprise you. I, I had decided when I was watching it, and probably this is the fault of having watched it and Alien, uh, in the same time. We talked about Alien last week. So I'm actually going to give Silence of the Lambs a 4.5 for okay. scares and uh, partially part of that is because i think the film is deeply unsettling and deeply creepy um and as i mentioned before i mean i it almost deserves a five for that hannibal lecter escape sequence alone um but uh i, I categorize it a little differently 
in than than I do most quote unquote scary movies. So four point five for me. All right, and last but certainly not least, um, in the category of substance, um, I, I'll, I'll lead on this, and this won't be any surprise. I actually am surprised at how clearly how much this mm. stirred up. Sure. Um, so I think uh, it's going to be just a no brainer to categorize this as a five on the substance meter. Yeah, I'm going to join right there with you. Uh, I think I think it's easily a five. I think it's it's so overtly uh, filled with things to talk about. I mean, the, the the conversation we went on and we you know, we referenced only marginally some of the narrative of the film. Uh, I think I think you could probably spend days in discussion groups talking about uh, this story. And I will say I don't always say this. That's but a long time. That's a long time. Days. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't always say this, but um, for any for any avid readers out there, um, if you've seen the film, the novel is almost, if not more, rewarding. The film is a very faithful adaptation of the novel, uh, but uh, the novel is is a very rewarding reading experience, and I would highly recommend you you checking out the novel Silence of the Lambs. Ted Talley did a brilliant job of adapting the screenplay. Jonathan Demme did a brilliant job realizing it to film as the director, um, but. Yeah, the, the novel is really quite outstanding, and I highly recommend it. Good to so, know. Well, Reed, um, we, we've we've given our pumpkins here. What what are we what are we at? So we give the Silence of the Lambs appropriately enough nine point five David S. Pumpkins, a firm even. Well, it's not even, but nine point five David S. Pumpkins. Uh, I think it every bit deserves that rating. I mean, the Oscars gave it. The top five, you know, I, I mean, know. it's <laughs> and we only and we, gave it nine point five, and we know how we know how accurate they are, <coughs> Suicide yeah, Squad. They, but um, <laughs> but uh, but as we say in every episode, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it is not the end of the conversation. We would love to hear from you about uh, any of the. So- we, we've had a really robust conversation here. If you have thoughts about things that we've brought up or things that we've said here, we would welcome your thoughts. Agree with us, disagree with us, challenge us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So you can do that in a variety I, of ways. I worry I'm going to get some unfollows after this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, if you want to reach out to us, you can reach out to us. Probably the easiest way is by Twitter. Uh, Nathan, what is our Twitter handle? Uh, the podcast Twitter handle is at the fear of God. You can also uh, reach out to us on Facebook. You can like us there. You can post on one of the posts we have, uh, post something else yourself. Um, there's a link to that through Twitter. You can also follow me on Twitter at Reed Lackey. And Nathan, where can they unfollow you on Twitter? <laughs> uh, at Reed Lackey. That's where they can unfollow me on Twitter. Uh, no, I am at the Nathan Rouse. You can also email us, fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com, not only about this episode or about anything you feel like emailing us about, but please, hashtag I love the 90s. Send us your nominations for your favorite horror films of the 90s uh, for a series later this year. Um, email us, fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. You can also go to morethanonelesson.com and leave a post on the official, uh, leave a comment on the official post for this site. Um, and you can also go over to iTunes if you listen to us that way, or even if you don't, and leave us a review. We would very much love if you appreciate uh, the content we bring you every week, then we very much love a review uh, stating that. Um, or even if you dislike us, just, you know, be kind. Uh, be kind, be smart, be loving. But um, there you go. that's right. Um, so, but in any capacity, thank you so much, Nathan, for having this conversation with me. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, listeners, very much for for enjoying. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, for engaging with us in this. And uh, check out social media to see what we're talking about next week. And we will see you then. Indeed. It's been fun, Reed. You! All right, everybody. (laughs) See you you next time, guys. Bye. Or sing. My father would often preach. Our, our whole family would get involved to some capacity, and uh, frequently, if we traveled far and enough, you would we would dance s- in a robe. <laughs> Boy, this took a turn. Boy, this took a turn. <laughs> and and none of the congregation expected it. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop. I have to stop. I have to stop before this yeah, gets too awful. You should. Um,